Um, Nihonbashi, I know not everyone in this room is uh, necessarily a Japanese studies background, so if you don't uh, already, if you're not familiar with the name, Nihonbashi is a bridge, bashi, uh, that spans one of the central moats around Edo Castle. Well, that's what I'll be talking about. And uh, the reason I, I chose it, I've been thinking a little bit recently about commemorations. Um, the Shogun's Silver Telescope, which uh, will be published hopefully next year, uh, was about the 400th anniversary of Anglo-Japanese relations, which we had a lot of events uh, in 2013-14 in Japan and Britain to commemorate that gift of a telescope from James I to Tokugawa Ieyasu. So I was thinking about commemorations, and I've also been quite interested in uh, Nihonbashi and the planning of Edo for quite a long time. And then I read a book which some of you may um, have come across Japanese capitals in historical perspective. And without wishing to, I mean, there's many fantastic things in that book, but there's one comment made in passing by one of the contributors that says that the shogunate built a new city. This was quite unusual for a Japanese regime to basically take a greenfield site and build a city. And despite having that opportunity, they never thought to build any kind of a commemorative center or um, the kind of thing that Alice was telling us about uh, in um, later regimes where they would build triumphal arches and, 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 and forecourts and places, that was never done. Uh, and I was thinking about that and I thought, well, actually, I can put these two thoughts together. Firstly, the shogunate did very much build an iconic center to its new city, and it did so to commemorate itself. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. An added little interest is that Nihonbashi has recently acquired significance in Japan because it's now being recreated by the Mitsui um, uh, Fudosang, real estate company that owns most of the land around there, in the expectation that in 2020 for the Tokyo Olympics, people will come. And when people go to a foreign city, they all go to the center, right? They go to Trafalgar Square, they go to the mall, they go to the Place de la Concorde. And if Tokyo doesn't have one, people are going to be wandering around looking for the center. And like <laughs> Roland Barthes, whose name's already appeared, uh, they won't find it. <laughs> but actually, Tokyo does have a center. It's been submerged and forgotten. And Mitsui uh, Fudosan can rebuild some buildings if they like. But more significant than that is what Nihonbashi really meant uh, at the time it was created. So I'll be talking about that center, that spot there. It's not quite ar ar architectural history. Uh, it's not quite art history, but it's the history uh, of a location. Uh, also, as we've been seeing as we've gone through the last two days, and we'll see tomorrow, I'm sure, as well, there are conscious borrowings when people deliberately set out to emulate another culture, to bring home something they've discovered abroad. Uh, but there are also unconscious borrowings and consciously submerged and accidentally submerged borrowings. And the global dimension of Nihonbashi, which I shall propose, is certainly a unconscious or obliterated borrowing. Nobody today would say Nihonbashi is a global place. It's a Japanese place. Uh, but I think they're wrong to say that. So, so let, me, let, me, let me go on and, um, uh, and, and really start the point. So Nihonbashi uh, is then a bridge over one of Edo's many waterways. And for those of you not yet familiar with the place, of course, Japan was in a state of civil war for the entire 16th century, in fact, for more than that. And I always emphasize this to students. So uh, just think of what it's like living in um, Libya or Iraq and imagine that happening for a century. Uh, it's completely impossible to con comprehend. And uh, the, of course, there were moments of somewhat peace and then it fell back into war again. But the Tokugawa family would kind of get away with what they got away with, an extraordinary achievement in turning Japan into this um, placid state. Uh, could, they could get away with it because the memories of war were so horrendous. I think people were prepared to go along with a regime that could at least guarantee peace. And looking back, you'd say, well, Saddam Hussein, at least he guaranteed peace. And not having peace is much worse than what happens um, you know, under a severe regime. Not that I'm saying Saddam Hussein and the shoguns were equivalent, but I mean that the, 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 the horror of um, a country at war, as the Japanese would have said at the time, ran. Right, a chaotic state was uh, the premise to what or everything that happened from circa 1600 to about 1620 when the Tokugawa regime sort of knows it's there to stay. So, of course, they're not 
in Kyoto, most of Kyoto, the Kyoto areas where um, power and authority in Japan had always been, virtually always been. Uh, but the Tokugawa family are ruling this area that would become Tokyo, and so would become very important, but initially it's a rather outlying place. And in fact, this area called Musashi not only was outlying, but was the very what's the word in, in, in Japanese, the daimeshi, right? It was the, it was the byword for absence, right? In the poetic tradition, which of course is so important to the history of Japanese self-consciousness, Musashi stands for the absence of everything. It is a place where all you see when you go there is tall grass, nothing. And that space of nothing becomes the center of the shogunal regime. Um, there are other things one can say about how the way, the way in which the shogunate turned this vacancy of Musashi into a center of authority. Um, today, I will only talk about this one spot of Nihon Bashi. So here is, in any case, the, um, the, kind of the place, the spot. The uh, castle will be built on a part of land which could sustain a castle building. It's a um, stone base, so it's not going to be too marshy and prone to flooding, and the rest of the city would be plotted out around it. This is, Edo is not yet there, but in um, a generation or so, we have Edo, of course, has spread widely over the surrounding hills, castle still in the center, and Nihonbashi is here. Now, the map's color-coded, so you, it's a bit fuzzy, but you, uh, I'll tell you that the, the purple is the religious institutions. I won't mention them at all today, but the sacralization of the space of Edo under the shoguns by the use of religious institutions was clearly very significant. Uh, but the orange is the bushy areas, the samurai areas, and of course they've got most of the space, including the area all around the castle. And then the red is, the, or the dark orange is the common area, so that's where we would all be living if we were there. At the, well, no, we would, we'd, we'd, we'd all be in Dejima, most of us, but um, if, the, if, you, if you, the Japanese people in the room would be living there. And, um, of course, there's only one highway. It was terribly important to make sure the city could never be uh, attacked. So whereas one would expect a grand city to be created on a grid, that's the way Japanese cities had always been, Edo being essentially a castle town, at least initially, it's built for protective purposes, castle in the center, very difficult for somebody who doesn't know the city, doesn't have the right to be there, to penetrate through. So just one highway really leading you all the way across the city and all the rest of it, an invading army would be lost in little streets and they'd soon be, you know, it's much easier for the defenders. But however, that highway, in fact, is two that join up and then pass. Through. See how all the other roads, they just stop when they get, to the, uh, they get to the moats. But this one only joins together and goes through. And just after they're joined together, this spot here, where there's one large moat that empties out into the bay. In fact, it's the last major moat area empties out of the bay. Nihonbashi is right there. So that's the exact spot. It's in the middle of the commoner district, which will mean, of course, that anyone can go there. The Samurai districts would be less accessible to commoners. You didn't just walk through unless you had a purpose for doing so. So this is absolutely in the thick of the city. It's not a hidden area. It's not a private area. It's where people actually would be and where they would go. And then just to finish the story, uh, when they get to the end of the Edo period, of course, Edo has hugely expanded. The religious institutions have made a, a, almost like a, a quarter arc uh, in, the, in one direction, and the river has been crossed, etc. But Nihonbashi, the bridge, is still right there um, in the common area. The moat hasn't changed, and it's all, it's all um, uh, unchanged. So we're dealing with a symbol which naturally mutated as the Edo period went by, but as a sp spatial location, it stayed there. It wasn't removed or obliterated or filled in or anything. It re remains there throughout the in entire Edo period. Now, this map, for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, in order for the label to be correct, I've put it this way up. But we're sort of looking northeast, in other words, uh, southeast. So this is north. I don't know why it's been oriented that way. But this is north, and, and that's important because the uh, alignment of Nihonbashi is part of its story. Let me um, try my paltry uh, skills at Photoshop to turn it around. <laughs> And I've not oriented to the north. We talked about maps yesterday and the orientation in which you expect them. I've deliberately put this so that up is here, the westerly direction, looking west. What it does show you, though, is that Nihonbashi is on a um, uh, canal that pretty much goes due 
east-west, and if you're on the bridge on, on Anihonbashi looking towards the castle, then you're looking in a westerly direction. Um, well, the moats probably were built for reasons of drainage and protection. Uh, they were not probably built with symbolic purposes in mind. But yet, when the shogunate comes to create a symbolic center, they put it they put Nihonbashi, they put this center uh, at a place which is on a north, which is on an east-west axis, uh, which therefore means the, the road is going north-south, so we have a, the cardinal points of the compass pretty much laying out there. Now, they never wrote down why they did this, they never wrote down what they did, so as a historian, I have tried to reconstruct, uh, and of course there are quotations and references, but there was never a blueprint, never, nobody had ever, ever, ever said. There was no houseman who left documents saying why he'd done it and what he'd done. But from what we uh, know and what we're entitled, I think, to interpret, we can come up with a fairly good uh, understanding of what Nihonbashi is all about. So firstly, it is a bridge over a canal. And that may be a little bit uh, interesting and unexpected for a um, city center. They called this the center. They called Nihonbashi the center of the realm. And they built there a bridge over a canal. Why? Uh, well, uh, I think that the bridge is something replete with meanings. We've already heard from uh, Professor Reis, the uh, bridge over troubled waters. In many, many languages, there is a, a, a notion a bridge is something which saves you from the turbulence of the water down below. To have a bridge is to be able to move safely without loss of life or loss of go goods across something which is potentially life-threatening, like a, a torrent or, 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 or a, a strong river. It, it happens that in the uh, history of Japan, but I think also of China and Korea, many ancient bridges are attributed to not great engineers who built them, but to holy men who built them. Uh, this is the case certainly with Japan's probably most famous and long-standing bridge at Uji, not far from Kyoto, which is uh, said to have been created by a holy monk in medieval times, and indeed in the Edo period, when restoration work was being done on the bridge, they excavated uh, a, um, uh, a stele from that period proving that indeed this, 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 it had been built by a holy man. So the making of bridges somehow or other is not just about engineering prowess and helping people cross rivers. It actually has some a spiritual dimension to it. And in Japanese thought and metaphor, to cross a bridge over troubled waters actually is more than just not getting your feet wet. It's crossing to the further shore is a... Um, an interpretation of achieving enlightenment. Right? The point of Buddhism is achieve enlightenment. Uh, sometimes there are stories and verses about we're in a boat and we're floating around and we don't know how we're going to get to the other shore and the, and the mast you know, the mast fallen down, there's no rudder, we can't get there. We're all human beings lost. Uh, but a bridge is what takes you to the, other, to the other further shore without any problem. And hence it's something that um, uh, spiritual leaders, guidance uh, is what takes you to the further shore. But as things which take you to the further shore, bridges tend to be the first uh, victim of war. Throughout the 16th century, Japan was pretty much denuded of all its bridges. Uh, having said that, there weren't that many to start with. <coughs> Being an earthquake uh, area with a lack of stones, not like Italy, we've got lots of marble to build, you know, whatever. Uh, there's very few bridges, uh, and uh, um, so there weren't many to go. And also in Japan, you tend to get springtime torrents which wash away bridges. It's much better to ford them or to have pontoon bridges, whatever. So Japan doesn't have that many bridges, but Uji, which I mentioned to you, uh, had been lost. And in fact, it wasn't the first time, because the loss of Uji in the first period of Japan's civil war, Japan's had many civil wars, the first great civil war which gave rise to the whole first shogunal government, uh, where the uh, Taira and, the, and the, um, uh, the Minamoto and the Genji, uh, Taira and, uh, Taira and the Minamoto are fighting, and the Taira rip up the bridge planks to protect Kyoto to stop uh, the invading army from coming in. And that ripping up the bridge planks, destroying the bridge as the terrible initiation of war. Right? Once the bridges are gone, it's a, it's a very emphatic thing to do. You can't build them again easily. Uh, you're going to be falling into chaos. And so conversely, the building of bridges is something that takes you out of war. And at this point, I like to remind people that uh, where the, the town that I come from, uh, where there is a famous bridge, and everyone knows the verse, London Bridge is falling down. 
uh, Rondon Bashi Ochita in Japanese. But I would like to point out that London Bridge never fell down. London, <laughs> London Bridge was deliberately dis dismantled to stop the um, Danes from coming in and attacking London. And the destruction of the bridge, the terrible thing of this bridge, which was built at great expense, difficult to maintain, can't easily be restored at the end of the war. Uh, it had to take it down. It's that bad, that dangerous. So uh, in Japan, too, all the bridges were gone. And therefore, the creation of a bridge is a sign that we're back in peace. Uh, and so it was the shogunate that decided to rebuild a bridge. Of course, it was needed, it was practical, it was useful, but it was built at a special point in their city. And they declared, this is the center of our city from now on. Uh, it was so wide and sturdy that people were amazed at it. It wasn't a huge bridge, really, in kind of, I mean, there were bigger, bigger bridges in other places, perhaps, but in that part of Japan, nobody had ever seen such a big bridge. But interestingly, more than the length of it, they seem to have been impressed by the width of it. It had a bar down the middle so that you crossed it on your right side of the road. On the left, actually. They drove on the left, same as today in Japan. Uh, they drove on the left. So that people were amazed, not just the bridge was wide and sturdy, but as soon as people started to cross the bridge, they started to behave with more de decorum than they walked along the normal roads. The normal roads, you need to go to shop one side, you go over, you back and forth, weaving in and around, pushing people about. But when you go to the bridge, suddenly you, correct, you, you corrected your deportment, you went lock cross on the right side. And so it seems, although the etymology is not quite provable because we don't have documents from this early stage, it seems that they decided to call the bridge the two-track bridge because it had two tracks. And Japanese verse and Japanese uh, thought being very reliant on puns. Two tracks, of course, is Nihon, and therefore it's the bridge of Japan, as well as being the two-track bridge. So it encompasses in its name uh, a, a true statement about what it is. It's a very wide bridge with two tracks, but also it's making a very um, powerful statement about what this is. This bridge is something now about Japan. It was uh, in the east because Edo was in the east. But it's orientated to look towards the west. If you look west, the first thing you would see there is the castle. Uh, and you are immediately seen this uh, is the castle, which has guaranteed the peace, which is emblematized by the bridge. Once peace has come, no more warfare, no more boys going off to die, no more women being raped, no more people who can't uh, do the agriculture anymore, starvation. The world is back uh, as it should be, uh, thanks to the bridge. But if you imagine yourself thinking on further than the castle, you would go to uh, further east, you go to Mikawa, which is where the Tokugawa family came from. Not everyone necessarily knew that, except that everyone who had any education read the tales of Issei. And the tales of Issei includes as a central part of the narrative, the Amakudari, the descent to the east, where the protagonist, who's not named, uh, leaves Mikawa, the very area that the Tokugawa family had come from, and crosses to this area. Uh, so that the descent to the east, the leaving of the old area of Kyoto and moving to this point from Mikawa is something that anyone educated um, knew about and was then reconfigured in the movement the Tokugawa family had personally made to come to this area. But even beyond Mikawa, you can think further east is Kyoto. At what point they became aware of it, I'm not sure. But at some point in the Edo period, they became aware that the sun rises earlier to the further east you go. And it was, became um, commented on that the sun shines on Edo Castle before it shines on Kyoto. So being to the east, of course, Japan is where the sun rises in the east. Being to the east is not any longer conceived of as something which is off there in the wilderness with the long grasses. It is asserting a pri priority and perhaps also, therefore, a protective um, capacity over Kyoto on which the sun will rise only after the people in Edo are already out of bed and about their business. And you can continue that vector further east because to the in the utter east is the pure land. Uh, and the Tokugawa family themselves, quite unusually for uh, a military family, were affiliated with the uh, pure land sect. They weren't a Zen family. So for the Tokugawa, personally, uh, meditation on the setting sun, meditation on the, on the west, I sometimes said east. Yeah. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That direction um, uh, uh, is uh, um, uh, it's one of the things about being left-handed. You tend to get east, west, left, right, wrong. <laughs> 
Um, the, the meditation on the setting sun as an important ritual within uh, Pure Land Buddhism, with which the Tokungar family would have been um, directly responsible. So I think that's why we have this, this vector. Well, since the... Um, uh, yes. Since we don't have the bridge anymore, it survived certain rebuildings. There are a couple of early illustrations showing what Nihonbashi might have looked like, but I would like to give you a, a later one to, um, to give you an idea. And this is a very famous image, so many... Okay. How do I get out of that? Um, just, uh, uh, of course, it's by Hokusai and, and, and terribly famous. It's much later. But this, I think, gives a quite a, a useful idea of how Nihonbashi might have been perceived. Uh, we are on the bridge looking w um, westwards is up there to the top right. The subsequent bridge was added only later. It wasn't part of the original configuration. But when they did decide a new bridge was built and, an, and another one should be added, they had to give it a name. And so what do they call it? They called it Yatsuhashi, which is the place in Mikawa where the Azuma Kudari begins from. Right. Very, very clearly. And then you see from that to the castle. Um, Hokusai has orientated the bridge, uh, the image, so that we see most prominently the foreground of the bridge and there to the left side of it. And uh, you can't probably see from where you're sitting, but the image is filled with people going around carrying ba baskets of fish. This was, in fact, Edo's fish market. So had you stood on the bridge and looked towards the castle, behind you, on, on both sides of the, of, the, of the waterway, was Edo's fish market. Perhaps it was useful to have the fish market as a place where people could easily travel around. Anywhere in the city you can get to it, thanks to the bridge initially, the only bridge, subsequently one of many bridges, but always the biggest and the best bridge, the market is well placed for that. But the fish market was not just uh, a convenient place to go and buy your food. Fish was what Edo was all about. And people today think that sushi is Japanese food. Of course it's not. Sushi is Edo food. You don't have sushi in, you don't have sushi in Kyoto. There's no fresh uh, sea. There's no sea anywhere around. So to have... Um, access to fresh fish plentifully, which means a very high nutrient value, even for people who are quite poor, people who lived in Edo um, should be healthier, and they are well provided for. And that's what first comes with peace, is the return of markets, uh, the, uh, the restabilization of supply uh, and demand. So by having this at Nihonbashi, it's telling you uh, the shogunate has provided peace and prosperity uh, and plenty for everyone. However, a fish market is uh, possibly smelly, and uh, it's, it's uh, inherently uh, commercial. It's not a very refined kind of spot. So it's put such that if you stand on Nihonbashi and look towards the castle, it's behind you. And what I'd like to suggest is, in fact, it's looking in front of you. That vista um, westwards is the key thing. And it's that which gives Nihonbashi its um, global significance. But before I come on to that westward, let me say a couple more things about the bridge. Um, this, again, is speculative. But the idea of making a bridge the center of Japan sort of makes sense, given what I said about the idea of bridges. That is, nothing, that is something within Japanese thought. But the idea of giving Edo a center at all is something which is completely alien to Japanese thought. As far as I know, no Japanese city nor any Korean or Chinese city had ever had a center before. In fact, I might go so far as to say that no Asian city had ever had a center, although I can't say that with confidence, correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly you have to go quite a long way geographically away from Japan until you find a center uh, of a city. Certainly, um, there may possibly have been castles which were centers of some Japanese castle towns, but these were not symbolic centers, or if they were, they weren't accessible to the people. They were simply where power was located. Nihonbashi is not where power is located. It's, it's a bridge. Where on earth did the idea of giving Edo a center at all come from? Well, I would like to speculate that this came from Europe. And we are, after all, talking about the time when uh, Jesuit priests, who have got mentioned a few times together today already, but let's not forget there are also Dominicans and Franciscans around in Japan. And they were bringing with them certainly uh, knowledge of European cities, of Seville, uh, of Rome. And the first Japanese embassy to Rome 
which uh, returns in, um, I, I didn't make a note, I think it's 1589, approximately, anyway, that uh, comes back with, thank you, 1590, comes back with um, Brown and Hogerberg's first volume of their um, view of, thank you, <laughs> their view of uh, cities. You actually saw an illustration from it from a previous speaker, but that is filled with images of Western cities, and every Western city would, would see itself as based around a symbolic core. Right. Not all of them yet have one. I mean, Trafalgar Square in London would not be uh, created for much, much longer after this. But the idea that you have a core which should be based on something which is accessible, uh, a city square, very often, of course, it goes back to Rome, Roman behavior. Uh, you might have a, um, a cathedral there. You might have embassies of foreign countries. You might have a palace there. You might have a museum there or such, such thing. But grouped around this central square, you have things of uh, political and also civic significance. And I'm pretty sure that's where the little light went off in someone's head uh, in Edo Castle, and they decided we'll depart from all precedent in Japanese cities. Edo is going to be something different and new. It's not just a rebuilt Kyoto, nor even a rebuilt Kamakura. It's going to be something new again. And they rather had to do this because they couldn't really build a grid city as they might have wanted because it's too dangerous in time of war. Uh, but also Edo, of course, was not the capital. What it was to be is the shogunal seat. And historians believe today that Nihonbashi was indeed erected in the year 1603. So it is specifically built the year of the de declaration of the shogunate. It is a commemoration of the fact that this city is not just a warlord's base anymore. It is the revived shogunate. There hadn't been a shogun for uh, half, a, half a lifetime at this point. The, the title had gone defunct, and so it's been restored with it. Order is back. Um, so... Um, there we have the bridge. But given that it was the on, on the only road through the town, and given that many people are going to be coming to Edo with the um, increasing appearance of peace, Edo becomes, as I've said a few times already, the official center of the city. I don't think any city before it had an official center, not just they didn't have a symbolic one. There was no sense that, this is, that the city gate is the important thing. But where inside? And so Edo becomes the city, and it becomes the center of a um, highway system. Now, I think many of you know about this. Japan, we, we saw this map previously. The, um, Japan is highly uh, difficult to get through, and I always tell students that um, imagine Switzerland. More students have been to Switzerland than have been to Japan, um, in, where I teach anyway. And uh, then I say, well, imagine Switzerland that goes from S Stockholm to Naples. I mean, that is what Japan is. You just simply can't hold the land together. It falls apart. It always has civil wars. Uh, it's Im impossible just to wander off and find yourself somewhere. You would get eaten by bears or attacked by brigands. So the highways are absolutely key to the maintenance of any sort of centralized authority within Japan. And they've been these ancient highways for many times. But of course, they all centered on Kyoto. <laughs> And when Gyorki was, no, whether he really made this map or not, but the map attributed to him, he had wandered the entire area of Japan. He knew where the roads were. His map is a road map. Right? This is not a political map. There's, there are political boundaries in a way. But the point of it is, is telling you how you pass through the Japanese landscape. And even the sea lanes are marked in. <laughs> and actually, this is still the case. I didn't know this until this summer when I was even the, the kokudo in Japan actually go across the roads. Did you know that? They go across the, across the water, right? So I went to Sado, and the Sado, the, the, you know, the, the kokudo takes you to the coast, and it picks up again the other side. And the, and the ferry track is actually a kokudo that's taking you to. In the old days, they were done by Japan Rail, right? But uh, uh, Kokutetsu, but now they're privatized. But still, it's nationally part, and that goes right back to this holding Japan together. The seas must keep the islands, you know, must, must, must embrace the islands. In any case, they set, settle on. Kyoto, nothing to do with Edo, which wasn't there for most of history. Take a look at the central place where they all come. I turn it the other way. It's drawn as a heart. Yamashiro is not that shape. Or at any rate, all the other political areas, kuni, are shown simply as blobs. Their shape is not significant. And yet, this map shows the center, Kyoto, at this time, as a heart. And 
Chinese medical books already show the heart this way. It's not a modern invention. Uh, it's clear that that's what is being said. Now, obviously, they didn't have a notion of the circulation of the blood, but they did have a notion that the heart is somehow core to the um, being and that the, whatever it is, the, the function the heart does uh, must be percussed throughout the whole being for the thing to function properly. Well, that's how the roads had always been. But with the creation of Nihonbashi from 1603, it suddenly changed. The entire center of Japan is switched to Edo, and the shogunate uh, doesn't restore all these old highways, but it, it creates the five highway system, which allows you to go pretty much unproblematically through Japan from Edo to Kyoto and Osaka, which is always a difficult bit. Once you've got as far as Osaka, the inland sea uh, allows pretty safe sailing. Uh, and there's, with, with the um, Lake Biwa, which would allow you to go across, right, you, can get, this is, you can get across this way relatively easily to that coast. But it's always, this is the real area of danger and difficulty and tidal waves and tsunami and things. So uh, where Edo being located, it must at any rate secure that route down, sorry, down to Kyoto, and that's done, and it begins, I think, or you, you all know this, uh, at, at Nihonbashi. So Nihonbashi is the uh, point zero of the entire highway system. It's not point one, interestingly enough. Uh, it's point zero, uh, and if you were then to go off on a journey somewhere, all these official highways have stations, and the Tokaido, the most famous one you all know, has 53 stations. Station one is about a couple of hours' walk from Nihonbashi, Takanawa, right, near Shinagawa today. Uh, and I did this just to see what it feels like. And um, it's, it was a very splendid road, it still is a very splendid road, that takes you right there from Nihonbashi. Um, and you go right in front of the, uh, um, uh, the uh, if I don't speak from notes, the great temple, <laughs> sorry, uh, the Tokugawa family mortuary temple. Zen 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 thank you, the, the, uh, the, 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 what do you say? <laughs> Not the Zen Koji. The Zor Georgie, thank you. The Zor Georgie, sorry. So that you're going past, I mean, that, uh, which is a huge sprawling place and would be much bigger than it is today. Uh, you're going past uh, a very, very clearly demarcated talking hour city. And then, you, uh, and then you're out into the countryside and you, of course, go down the 53 stations of the Torquay door. Um, it's worth saying in passing that some scholars have suggested why there should be 53 stations. Why not have 51 or 58 or, or 6? Um, but 53 is the number of steps taken by the boy seeking enlightenment in the Kegon Kyo, or the Garland Sutra. So it's speculated that the Tokugawa regime decided, presumably consciously, it can't have been an accident, to make the chip from Edo to Kyoto somehow or other assimilating into this magical number of 53, which takes you from ignorance to enlightenment or rather from this world's knowledge, the boy doesn't begin as a fool, he just begins as somebody who's not enlightened, to the enlightenment which Kyoto would represent, which after all was the, the capital throughout this period where the um, emperor lives, or probably more importantly in talking our thoughts, where all the great temples were located. Let's also remember, in case you want to make the distinction between Edo Shogunal City and Kyoto Imperial City, no, of course, the biggest building in Kyoto is the Shogunal Castle, not the um, Royal Palace. So um, Nihonbashi is then built, uh, created, and turned into a place from which the entire country is held together, possibly like a heart relocated to a different area. Um, but I'm interested, and we're all interested in, in, in global dimensions. Placed there at Nihonbashi was a building which I'm sure you've all heard about, and the picture on the left, Hokusai's famous view of the Dutch people in Edo. I don't know um, how often you've thought about where exactly that was. Um, and in fact, it's right at Nihonbashi. They gathered at Nihonbashi the three most important buildings, I suppose you could say, or at any rate, the three buildings that most emblematize the Tokugawa authority. And if you were to think to yourself, you've had a, a century of civil war, and there's a regime that's come back, and it's announcing that it is in control again. Control of what exactly? Think of three or four things that you must control to have proper authority. And you can come up with various ones, I suppose. But what the Tokugawa regime, whoever plotted this out, came up with was the control of space, the control of time, and the control of value. I think that's pretty good. I uh, think once you have those three things, whoever has those three things, space, time, and value um, controls. And so, let me tell you what I mean by that. 
The control of space is the ability to call people in from outside, to require people to be at a certain place at a certain time, especially, of course, regional lords. The way in which the 280 or so daimyo that ruled Japan were plotted around the city is a complex issue, and I'll have to leave that for another time. But at any rate, the Dutch, who are coming from further than anyone else, they are really the only people that announce to the world that the shogun has a global reach. They come to Edo and they are set in a hostel right at Nihonbashi. And if you were to stand on the bridge and look towards the castle, it is on your right. Standing on the bridge, you wouldn't probably have seen the building. It wasn't terribly big. In fact, the Dutch always complain about having come so far. They see themselves ambassadors. They have to live in this miserable little um, hut while they're in Edo. The only two images of it that were ever produced, the one on the left by Hokusai, you all know. The one on the right is, for some reason, much less well known by Hiroshige. They're both from guidebooks. But if you look at the dates, you can see they're both from the 19th century. And that's very interesting. In fact, Hokusai's book was published in 17. 99 in black and white, and then reissued in 1802 in color. But still, it's from the very, very end of that period. And the Dutch East India Company, by 1799, is bankrupt. So they don't come to it end it anymore. Right? So this can only be depicted, this is kind of a sideline, but it, being interested in the iconography of power as I am, one thing which is very interesting in Japan is, of you can't depict things which are powerful. This came up with the issue of the stamp that doesn't have the royal couple's face on it just now. Um, so you can't depict, so you can only make pictures of the Dutch coming to Edo to do honor, do honor to the shogun after they stopped doing it. Right? Until that point, of course, you could go and see them, you were supposed to see them coming, parading in. But you shouldn't talk about it, you shouldn't make pictures about it, you shouldn't analyze it or subject it to the kind of scrutiny which would be regarded as an ins insolent. People can't scrutinize their superiors. So in neither of these images are we given anything very clear, even though the, it's now become a historic event, it doesn't happen anymore. We still aren't, it's not very clear. And in Hokusai's case, although virtually every image in his book has a very clear label telling you where the place is, because it's after all a guidebook, this alone, virtually alone, does not have a label, which I suppose would have allowed him, if he'd ever got called in, or if his publisher had ever been called in, uh, uh, and accused of insolence to the state, um, they could have denied or said, no, no, this is a view of somewhere else. Uh, however, we've got the Dutch people with their red hair behind the window. It's clear where we really are, but he's showing deference and not labeling it. So that's the control of um, space. Literary historians have talked a bit about this too because there are several verses. In fact, Bats Bashaw himself is attributed two verses on the arrival of the Dutch East India Company into Edo. It was a very public event. Initially, they came in the wintertime. But the problem with that is that there often was snow, and it wasn't very comfortable to travel in winter. Also, winter is a time of conflagrations, because everyone's keeping themselves warm with, with braziers. And two years running, the Dutch East India Company hostel burnt down while they were in it. And so they decide to move it to spring. But once it's moved to spring, it's more pleasant for the Dutch. It also means they come for cherry blossoms. And one of uh, Bashaw's rather obsequious verses is the Dutch, the Dutch people, too, have come to view the blossoms. Springtime for my lord. All right. So the shogun's uh, wonderful spring is being welcomed by the Dutch. So that's um, number one. Number two, the control of time. And in a battle situation, you just um, go when you're commanded. If the commander says, get up and, 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 and march, then you, you do it. Uh, similarly, in an agricultural situation, your daily round will be simply a matter of the sun and the seasons. But when Edo becomes a grand city of uh, people engaged in business, possibly even contracts, expectations, turning up to work, you need time. Suddenly, you need time which you hadn't needed before. Uh, and so it is the shogun who personally makes the gift of time to the city by giving a bell. And the bell had previously regulated life within Edo Castle, where, of course, there had already been, as long as the castle was there, there were people summoned at various hours to do certain things. But the city had not yet been under a regime of chronological, chronometrical um, uh, uh, stability. So the, symbolically, the bell is removed from the castle and handed out and hung in Nihonbashi, just a couple of steps away from the Dutch East India Company's compound. 
As far as I know, in the entire Edo period, nobody ever made a picture of the time bell, because being as if a gift from the shogun, it would be insolent to subject it to the scrutiny required to depict it. I've only ever found also two literary references to it, although the Dutch quite often complain about the noise it makes, keeping them awake during the night. And the location is Nihonbashi, but there's a more specific place name for the place where the bell is or was, and it's Hongoku-cho. And today that's written with koku meaning the unit of measurement, kokudaka no koku. But I suspect, and I want to think, and I can't prove, but I think that koku originally means hour, jikoku no koku. So this is the place of true time. Right? From here, all time emanates out. And in many countries before we get you know, modern timekeeping, who controls time is key. Uh, in you know, where I come from, again, very, we're always told as children, Big Ben is not on the palace. Big Ben is on the parliament. Right? The king does not control time. The king is under parliament too. But in this case, uh, the, um, it's the shogunate that's controlling time. And the bell was lost three times in the Edo period to fire, and each time it was rebuilt at shogun expense. The one which is there today, I'm sorry, it's a very bad image, is uh, from the late 18th century, the last rebuilding set in the modern concrete bunker. So here you've got the Hongoku Cho with the way it's normally written, but I think it probably is koku, jikoku time. Um, the third building, the control of value, was the Kinza. You probably know about the Ginza, the silver monopoly, which survives, of course, as an important Tokyo place name. But the Kinza, the uh, gold monopoly, was where coinage was minted. And that was also an important reclamation for Japan because through much of the Sengoku period, people don't use Japanese coin because it's completely untrustworthy. There's no authority that can issue it with probity, so they use Chinese money. Now, Chinese money was regularly used, and one of its early acts, the shogunate, forbids the use of Chinese money because they can now substitute it with credible Japanese currency, the Kangei Tsuho, which lasts for, 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 for generations. That uh, gold monopoly, as far as I know, was also never ever made the subject of a picture, nor was it ever even discussed. Uh, historians have tried to figure out the size of it and the shape of it and dimensions and such things. Interestingly enough, the Bank of Japan is still on the same spot. So the Bank of Japan has not moved for 400 years. <laughs> but it seems to figure in another very well-known image, which uh, you know this, of course, but I suspect it's the gold roofs under the castle um, here. So standing on the bridge, looking west towards the castle, the Dutch East India Company compound and the bell are behind. They don't need to be waterfront. The waterfront is for um, go-downs and warehouses. So they've said it, but we can't see them. But we know they're there. And you might even sometimes hear them. But we do seem to see here, just hidden amongst clouds, the um, gold monopoly. This picture, which is the last one I'll show you before I stop, uh, can also tell us a few other things about Nihonbashi. Uh, we see the bridge, of course. We look down the waterway to the castle. We can see the Yatsuhashi Bridge, which was added later on. But something else is there, very grand in the view, and it's Mount Fuji. And that surely is the reason why the three buildings I've just talked about are all lined up down the right-hand side, because that authority of the contemporary realm of Japan is kind of pivoted against Mount Fuji rising up behind. Now, Hokusai knew about Western perspective, as you can see from this picture. He, on the whole, doesn't like to use Western perspective because it's not um, very interesting. And I was talking to this about a college, colleague of Islamic art, where they refer to um, Western style perspective as the Christian prison. <laughs> right, um, it's a terrible thing to do to a picture to like wreck it by putting in these kind of mathematical things on it. So, but Hokusai is interestingly put the perspective on the middle area, so the commoners who are crossing the bridge down there are kind of pressed down to the bottom where commoners should be, and then the central area is very much expanded. And that central area, you know, why is he expanded it? Well, it's, these are, these are the official merchants who are supplying the castle. It's not the fish market which is behind us; we can't see it. These are the um, Goyotachi, the merchants who are bringing supplies from all over the country, possibly even 
all over the world to um, make sure the castle is adequately supplied. So we see that vast expanded area which Hokusai uh, can use perspective to deliver to the viewer. Um, but then if you want to have it really in perspective, you'd have to have the castle as a little dot at the end. And of course that would be insolent. So he's broken the perspective to allow the castle to sail up above the perspectival zone. Uh, what compromises uh, the rest of us can't compromise rule. And if I jump all the way back to the image I began with, we can see, I should have made a second one, sorry, but of course he's done exactly the same thing here. It wasn't that he ran out of space to draw the castle. He deliberately made the castle uncompromised by that, it's not quite the Christian prison, but it's a, maybe it's a Chinese prison, right? It's a, it's a frame around the picture, and he's gone to all the trouble of deliberately breaking the picture, castle out, he even put the castle, of course, in the top right hand corner, the position of most importance. So he's doing a similar sort of thing here, and we have opposite it, Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji, uh, at the time when uh, Nihonbashi was created, was in its pristine state of symmetrical beauty. By the time Hokusai made his picture, Fuji had had its terrible eruption, which had destroyed its symmetry. The right-hand side acquired a nasty lump, which the shogun of the period, Yoshi, Yoshitsune, Noshi Yoshi, uh, uh, the sh dog shogun, um, was uh, so upset, he said this was the um, second worst thing that ever happened in Japan. The first worst thing was the destruction of the Todaiji in the uh, civil wars. And the second worst thing was Mount Fuji losing its beautiful appearance. But by losing its appearance, this is the last point I'll make, by losing its beautiful symmetry, it became possible to see whether you were seeing Mount Fuji from the east side or from the west side. Until then, you couldn't tell. Right. And Yukio Lippitt's interesting recent book about, uh, which talks a lot about the depictions of Mount Fuji, you can say that Mount Fuji in its established iconography uh, is how Seshu depicted it, which of course is from the Kamakura side, from the, uh, from the Shizuoka side. He shows the sea on the left, and there's the uh, Seikenji temple, and then there's Mount Fuji rising up. It's very clear you're seeing it from the uh, Kyoto side. Uh, but here, of course, we're seeing it from the Edo side. And although not initially clear, it becomes clear later on that the Fuji that we see, the Fuji that is seen from the center of Japan, that is Nihonbashi, is the Fuji of the shogunate. It is no longer the Fuji of the court. And this is where Nihon really begins. Thank you for your attention.